All right. Good deal, day to all of you joining us today as we celebrate the Bond Challenge 2020 milestone. Uh, my name is Elmedina Kralashevich and I will be your moderator today for, for this brief webinar session uh, and a speaker on IUCN-led restoration efforts uh, on monitoring. Before we started, uh, I wanted to give a special thanks to our generous host today, which is Climate Focus and Julian Gladstone, who will be one of our panelists. Uh, and Climate Focus is streaming the webinar as part of the hashtag Restore Our Future Online Movement. And also, I would like to uh, welcome our guests today. We have uh, Julian Fox from FAO and speaking on behalf of the UN Decade Monitoring. And we have Katie Ryder from WRI as well joining us. I will start kicking off by saying that measuring restoration progress represents a unique challenge. Uh, measuring restoration means that we need to capture the changes in both natural and the socioeconomic systems. And it requires a systems approach while uh, it's most often faced with hurdles. And I will, I will give you a few examples of what those hurdles look like and invite our speakers to tell us a little bit more about how their work and how their initiatives are, 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 are are tackling at least some of those uh, some of those challenges. Uh, for example, the need to observe the change over long time horizons. Uh, the the outcomes of the activity from from today uh, on restoration will be able to demonstrate themselves maybe in five, 10, 20 years from now. Uh, then the issues with data availability, where they're in many cases they're not existent, or if they are, they might be scarce, they might be not compatible or not scalable. Uh, many countries also today have limited capacities, both in terms of their human capacity and in terms of technology. Uh, also, monitoring restoration can be expensive, and uh, there is a need for transparency and consistencies while we also are integrating uh, national, national priorities in our restoration monitoring systems in order to make them relevant and make them actionable. And as a result of that, you can imagine that many initiatives have attempted to tackle these issues. Uh, today, we have the representatives of the three global initiatives that are, that are approaching this uh, uh, challenge from a systems approach. And uh, I will just mention briefly, these are the restoration barometer uh, that was uh, kicked off in 2016. Uh, the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, specifically the monitoring task force uh, that, was, that is operational this year and the Global Restoration Observatory that was uh, started last year and it's accelerating in 2020. And today we'll be hearing about them and how they tackle some of these challenges. Uh, in that context, I will stop here and uh, I will ask Julian to tell us about the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration and, and Julian, how do you approach uh, the restoration monitoring as part of that? Thank you very much, El Medina, and thank you to Gillian for organizing this. It's fantastic to be here. So my name is Julian Fox. I'm from FAO's Forestry Division, and we've been tasked with uh, developing the, the op an operational monitoring framework for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration in collaboration with yourselves and many other uh, partners. So I'll say a few words about what we're trying to do, and then I'll, I'll touch as much as I can on El Medina, and then I think pass to some of the other panelists. So really the task force's key objective is to develop an operational monitoring framework for the UN decade to track progress as we attempt to restore degraded ecosystems on an unprecedented scale. So we need to identify biophysical and socioeconomic indicators that can be used to measure the progress of restoration efforts for all ecosystems, uh, forests, uh, for terrestrial, marine, wetlands, peatlands and inland waters. So it's a very challenging task. But we also want to support uh, people, communities and countries in, in monitoring their own restoration progress through method, methodological guidance, through technology and innovation. And some of the other panelists are really pushing, pushing on that direction. So we really want to transfer technology in partnership with many, with many other groups and develop capacity for people, communities and countries to monitor their own progress on restoration. Um, it can help create that really critical information by those who are undertaking restoration um, for by supporting people, communities and countries to monitor their own restoration progress. Uh, we can sort of support effective and adaptive restoration actions in a changing climate, which will be necessary. We can support the creation of locally relevant information. So that really builds ownership and trust in the restoration actions and can also generate the quality information for reporting the progress of the decade, which is our overall objective. So also quality locally relevant data and information can also catalyze investments in ecosystem restoration, which are needed. And I think uh, many of us are, are working to improve that. Just to plug our, our FAO work, 
I mean, we've, we've developed this open forest initiative and it's been quite catalytic for us in, in technology transfer and capacity development for forest monitoring. And us and many partners are using tools like Collect Earth and CEPAL and, and there have been a big success in enabling the stakeholders to generate the data that they need in a really transparent and scientifically robust way. So now the real challenge of, of the task force and of, of our partners is to move beyond the forests because we've seen a lot of progress, I think, on forest monitoring, forest restoration monitoring, and now we need to tackle the, the other ecosystems. So we've we, we established the task force at the end of March uh, this year, just as we went into lockdown in Rome, and, uh, and we've had really excellent collaboration in, in the process. We, it's a voluntary partnership of 170 experts across 60 organizations, and we just really thank everybody for chipping in for this global restoration movement, which is a wonderful sort of driving uh, ambition for, for everyone involved. Um, the idea is that we, we develop an operational monitoring framework, we, we launch it at or near the start of the decade and then we, we continually strengthen it through the decade because we know that some ecosystems there are gaps. We've, we, there's a lot of uh, progress thanks to the work of, of the organisations represented here on, on forests and, and terrestrial ecosystems. But for the non-terrestrial ecosystems we really need to look into technology and innovation and, and sort of fill those data gaps through, through the decade. Um, so a quick update on our progress. We, uh, we're making good progress. We have a draft of what we call the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring, as summarized as the firm. Um, we've, we've mapped all the existing indicators. The, the Global Restoration Initiative Observatory has been really helpful for the, for the forest indicators and many of the SDGs. And we, we're, in September, we're going to work with the ecosystem experts to identify sort of a key set of indicators and then in October we, we plan to have some virtual workshops looking at how technology and innovation can help generate data and solutions for those for those sort of key indicators. For us that's really important because we want we want these technical solutions to be used by restoration stakeholders with with the with the uh, with the capacity development. So as I said, we see a lot of movement and progress on the biophysical monitoring of terrestrial ecosystems, really building on the fantastic work of IUCN's restoration barometer and the Global Restoration Observatory. Um, the one gap we're seeing is in the non-terrestrial ecosystems. They're just flagging, I think, through the decade, we'll, we'll We'll be working on those to, to strengthen the, the gaps in data uh, to monitor those ecosystems. So on that note, I pass back to Al Medina and um, yeah, really look forward to a great uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Great. And I'm actually just going to um, jump right in. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. Really happy to be joining you all, um, colleagues today, to talk about efforts underway to build capacity for restoration monitoring. My name is Jillian Gladstone. I work for an organization called Climate Focus, and I'm coordinating the development of the GROW. So the Global Restoration Observatory, or the GROW, is a multi-stakeholder initiative of leading data providers and think tanks convening to fill an essential data gap. Um, El Medina mentioned the challenge of data availability. Um, climate focus is found in our work assessing progress against the New York Declaration on Forests, but there isn't a globally consistent transparent data set available to measure progress on forest landscape restoration on a systematic basis. So the GROW seeks to address the knowledge and data gaps currently hindering that restoration monitoring in order to increase the impact of existing restoration goals and platforms such as the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which Julian's just talked about, the Bond Challenge, as well as reporting of nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. So we're doing that by undertaking a consultative, peer-reviewed approach to developing the best available data, ensuring consistency in methods, and defining restoration progress. The GROW will serve as a central intelligence hub that develops, compiles, assesses, and publishes globally consistent and regularly updated data to measure progress on restoration. The GROW will provide information that's easy to interpret for a general audience, showing where there's been restoration successes and more and more effort is needed. 
the global analysis will complement country-owned regional and project assessments to inform decision makers about the status of existing projects and potentials for new restoration efforts. So under the GROW, more than 20 universities, civil society organizations, international organizations, and research institutes are providing the strategic and technical input into the development and ensuring coordination and full complementarity with these initiatives. Um, the restoration barometer, the UN Decades work, um, and other initiatives in this space. And i um, really happy to be working with these partners on um, aligning these uh, restoration monitoring efforts over the coming months. So now I am going to pass to um, a key partner in the GROW, uh, WRI, Katie Reiter, to talk a little bit more. Hey, thanks so much, Jillian. And thanks for hosting, and it's great to be here with El Medina and Julian on this panel. Uh, my name is Katie Raytar. I'm a GIS analyst at World Resources Institute, who is uh, leading our team on forest and landscape restoration monitoring. Um, as, as Jillian and El Medina mentioned, there are currently gaps in data that, that make reporting on restoration progress difficult, especially on a global scale. Um, but at WRI, we're working on figuring out how to address these data gaps. Um, as a contributing member of the Global Restoration Observatory and also supporting the UN Decade on uh, Ecosystem Restoration and the Restoration Barometer. Um, and so the, the difficulty in measuring and monitoring restoration is, is really due to the nature of restoration itself. Um, restoration is comprised of, of slow-paced activities that start out with subtle changes in the landscape and then expand and scale over time. Um, so detect, to detect these small changes, we kind of need to, to think outside the box and, and turn to new technologies and different methods. Um, but luckily, new advances in data and tools have enabled um, detection of, of biophysical change um, better than ever before. And so we think the time is right to really harness these developments to uh, report on progress on restoration and take stock of the investments and pledges and goals that have been declared through the Bond Challenge and, and, and other initiatives. Um, so, in, with, with online systems like WRI's Global Forest Watch, uh, anyone anywhere can, can monitor the loss of forests over, over time and in near real time, but it's surprisingly very difficult to detect the gain of forests in trees. Um, you know, whereas loss typically occurs with big trees and it happens fast, uh, tree growth starts with small ones and, and the trees grow slowly over time, and whereas loss typically occurs in large blocks and growth is uh, the, uh, the tree growth is often dispersed. And so these are things that are much more difficult to detect, but it, it's not Im impossible. And through initiatives like GROW, um, we're working to develop globally consistent and regularly updated spatial data on tree cover gain that, that would be available to everyone. Um, and so, uh, but a, a complicating factor is that restoration, you know, in both concept and practice includes a wide variety of activities. Um, restoration can be about creating new areas of dense forest, um, but it can also involve adding or improving sparse tree cover on croplands and pasture, which we typically call trees outside forest. And these types of interventions are often overlooked because they are harder to detect and quantify. Um, therefore, so when we think about satellite-based technologies to monitor and quantify restoration progress, we have to start thinking about which satellites and methods are, are best at detecting the different types of restoration activities. Um, for instance, to, to capture areas of dense tree cover, we can use Landsat satellite data, which has 30 meter resolution, which is typically um, good enough to detect dense clusters of trees that once they reach a certain height of two to five meters. Um, but for the sparser and smaller tree cover, we need to use much higher resolution imagery and other methods because these tend to be more difficult to pick up. Um, we've been uh, using, uh, as Julian mentioned, Collect Earth, which is a tool developed by FAO, um, which is very good at detecting the sparse tree cover in, in dry lands and, and outside of forests. Um, it, it uses um, 50 centimeter or less imagery and a sample-based approach to, to detect um, sparse tree cover. Um, and another emerging, emerging technology that we've been, we've been piloting is using artificial intelligence. Um, in these cases, we use training data to, um, to uh, 
produce, uh, to, to, to show trees on imagery and then uh, use this training data to detect in, in other imagery samples, um, identify trees, um, sparse tree cover on the landscape. And this method can produce wall-to-wall -wall tree cover maps at a resolution of 10 meters or less. And it's, it's something we're, we're really investing a lot in now to, to try to you know, get at this, these restoration activities that typically aren't, aren't counted for in, in other uh, methods. Um, and while we recognize that restoration progress is not simply the measure of vegetation increase, there's a lot of associated uh, uh, and important parts of restoration um, that aren't just biophysical, like um, biodiversity or, or carbon sequestration, and food security, and, and so socioeconomic uh, uh, improvements. So we're also you know, looking into these social indicators as well, um, but we're also generally trying to take it step by step and starting with the bi biophysical. Um, and that's, you know, upon which other indicators of progress can be built. Uh, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to El Medina. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, I will uh, use the opportunity to introduce you with the restoration barometer and uh, building on some of the, on, on the points that already have been made by my colleagues here. Uh, in terms of how we address the gaps, I'm going to be focusing on the few that we maybe have not been talking so much uh, today. So, but before that, I, I, I will say a few words about the barometer and what it is. Uh, so the restoration barometer is a uh, universally applicable systematic framework for identifying and assessing, assess, assessing actually the track and uh, tracking action on restoration and can be applied worldwide. It originated in 2016 to support the progress tracking with the implementation of the bond challenge commitments. But in reality, it has been applied to measure the progress of ongoing restoration efforts in the broadest sense. Uh, in turn, so Barometer does have two main dimensions. Uh, and one, is, one dimension is focused on the success factors, uh, looking through the policy, finance, and technical underpinning. And the other uh, dimension is focused on the results and benefits. So this is where we focus on, on, on the numbers of hectares under restoration and looking at the associated climate, biodiversity, and, and economic benefits from that. As Katie mentioned, these are important too. Uh, in 2018, the barometer produced a global uh, restoration progress report and an online tool uh, where we focused on a narrow subset of champion countries. In this case, it was 18 countries. Uh, that reported a little over 43 million hectares under restoration. Uh, both the online tool and the report are hosted by InfoFLR and they can be found at the infofLR.org. So in that context, I would, I would uh, suggest to our viewers to, to check it out. Uh, talking about the, the challenges, um, giving the design elements, the barometer has been able to tackle some of these critical issues uh, about how do we introduce a systematic approach to measure and reporting restoration progress. Uh, so, for example, uh, given the long time horizons from, from starting an FLR activity to achieving a restoration outcome, we have introduced a set of proxies that speak about the enabling environment for restoration. Uh, the science allows us and our experience also confirms that the selected causal pathways for the barometer are a good predictor of the likely uptake of the restoration and success. So in this context, the barometer allows the decision makers to target enabling activities where they're needed the most. Uh, additionally, while we are relying on global consistent data sets wherever possible, the barometer also allows for the integration of local and country data into global progress reporting platform. Uh, we need to aggregate progress report from the landscape to national levels because this is where usually the progress is found. Uh, and uh, that, that's how we can uh, broaden our, our understanding of where the restoration is happening and how. Uh, experts also can support the verification of the progress through a set of consistent and credible steps that are captured by the barometer protocol. And uh, while when we're using the, the country report, reporting data, this means that we can also address countries' priorities uh, and also help with other several reporting requirements. And you know, hence, we are bringing additional efficiencies into the, the reporting systems. Uh, in that sense, the barometer aims to facilitate the reporting requirements to the international environmental conventions, for example. Uh, that Julian mentioned before. Uh, since, uh, this, since the initial stage of the barometer, we have been able to absorb the available data while simultaneously we set up the baseline for the barometer's continuous improvement. Uh, 
Uh, in that sense, the barometer is a tool that grows and matures along with and in support of restoration ambition. Uh, so in, in the coming year, the barometer will be profiling some of uh, some more significant significant expansions. Uh, I will mention two here as, as a teaser. Uh, first is going to be in the geographic scope uh, to apply the barometer to 20 additional countries, maybe even more. Uh, that is the goal. And the second is about integrating data from, from uh, satellite GIS based monitoring platforms, like the one of MAP Biomass and other operational platforms to be able to speak better about the restoration progress. Uh, and for my last closing statement here, I will say that the barometer and IUCN are proud to embark on the UN Decade Restoration Journey together with our many other partners, which is prompting our closing question for Julian today uh, and uh, giving the mic back to him uh, if he could tell us what that means for the, for the UN Decade and how can we align better and collaborate better on monitoring restoration things. Oh, thanks so much, Almadina, Katie, Gillian. I've been taking a lot of notes. I'm really excited to also hear the updates from everybody. Um, well, as I think as we've, we've, we've seen here, there's a lot of excitement around the restoration movement and, and the monitoring community has, uh, has really stepped forward and um, these wonderful initiatives and activities that, that all our respective organizations are embarking on. A, a key goal of the, of the decade is to really seek synergies and streamline our efforts to avoid duplication and we've experienced a real willingness to collaborate uh, on this. I mean, it's been, it's been remarkable. We, we have had calls with just about everybody working in this space. We're, we're working together sort of for real collective action on restoration. I mean, the willingness to collaborate has, has enabled our progress on the monitoring for the decade and all, all the work that's been dis has, has been discussed here has, has been essential to help us progress. I mean, we're building on what has come before, um, the forest and landscape restoration mechanism, IUCN's bond challenge, which we're celebrating in the restoration barometer, WRI's work on restoration, which goes well beyond GROW and the Global Restoration Observatory and many others. It's really exciting. Um, I mean, the vision of the decade uh, is to support and further strengthen all these initiatives and really to strengthen them in catalyzing actions um, for really science-based uh, restoration. Yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole decade wants to, to build this momentum toward this science-based global restoration movement with actions on the ground monitored and informed by the best available, available biophysical and socioeconomic information. So from the perspective of the decade and FAO, um, it's a really exciting space and uh, it's a busy space. We're all, uh, we're all on calls 24 hours a day, but it's all going to be worth it in, the, in, in strengthening the, the data and the science behind the global restoration movement. But on that note, I'll pass back to our hosts, Gillian or Almadina, to, um, to wrap up. Thank you very much, everybody. Gillian, go ahead, please wrap up. Yeah, thank you so much. Just want to thank everyone for um, joining today. This was a really interesting and useful conversation and look forward to checking out the rest of the content happening um, today uh, through the Restore Our Future event. Thanks, everyone. Right, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.